Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In week 8 of uh, and lesson 1 of this course, we will study about health policy with particular focus on India's health policy. I have designed today's lesson in three parts. First, we will try to understand some of the general features that accompany discussion about national health systems. Uh, subsequently, we will study about uh, the three typologies of uh, health systems that is generally discussed in the literature of health economics, followed by uh, a brief discussion about Arrow's impossibility theorem and its relevance in the context of designing of national health policies. And then finally, we will end today's discussion with a focus on India's national health policy. Now, what are the general considerations for a national health policy? Generally, when we talk about health policy, we uh, tend to focus a lot on health financing. And before we can get into the design of health financing policies, we need to have some kind of a conceptual framework as to uh, why the focus on uh, financing and what is the economic criteria that guides uh, focus on financing. So, in terms of general considerations for a national health policy, there are a few questions that occupy our minds. First is, should the system have universal coverage and if so, how should it be attained? We have studied in the last class in, uh, in some of the earlier classes about health insurance coverage. We have studied about the issues of moral hazard and adverse selection. And uh, we have also discussed about uh, the heterogeneity is prevailing within a nation. Now, given the uh, context of diversities that we have and given the context of uh, economic problems surrounding insurance, it is a very uh, relevant question to ask as to whether a system should have universal coverage and if it has to have universal coverage, how should it be attained? Secondly, how does government financing take place or how should government financing take place? What should be the scope of benefits and cost sharing in a universal plan? How does controlling of expenditure take take place. Uh, this question is pertinent when we are discussing about increasing government expenditure as a percentage of total GDP. Uh, it is in this context that issues such as this hold uh, uh, prime importance. And finally, uh, given the uh, technological change that is happening around us, uh, which has engulfed the health sector as well, how are new technology introduced in the health system? Now, when we uh, think of universal coverage, it is pertinent to ask why universal coverage and we have studied most of the reasons in detail as of now. However, it is important to reinforce two important four points. First is that medical care is a merit good and the economic logic is that each citizen derives some utility from other citizens ability to consume the merit good, thus making a collective demand for good exceed the private demand. So, there is a collective demand for the good which is far more than the private demand for the good. So, in that sense medical care is a merit good and therefore, it requires universal coverage, but the question of how universal coverage is to be provided is a policy matter. Secondly, people without insurance are generally considered free riders who rely on the healthcare system safety net. Now, what is the safety net? In welfare states, uh, safety nets ensures that anyone who needs care, especially in hospitals and emergency rooms, receive it even if they cannot pay. And some individuals choose to be without insurance and end up as free riders. So, universal coverage in a way uh, tries to account uh, for people who are considered free riders and who rely on healthcare system safety net. So, how does universal coverage then help us to deal with these issues? Creating universal insurance deals with the free rider problem and the most substantial argument for universal coverage is the market failure argument because markets fail to provide efficiently the uh, some kind of medical care for people who deserve the most. There is an equity trade-off when we uh, talk about uh, market provisioning of health care and therefore, we need to step in in the form of some kind of a universal coverage. And finally, a country creating universal insurance can at least improve the average well-being of its citizens, which is what the focus is on if you look at um, this in the context of neoclassical economics. 
Now, how can a society accomplish universal insurance? There are of course uh, some very uh, tried and tested methods. Direct government provision of health care or health insurance is one way. Mandatory purchase of health insurance by all individuals with financial support from government or targeted groups. For example, you can think of Ayushman Bharat in the context of India. Um, requirement that employers provide insurance for their workers. The uh, health insurance programs that uh, employers have within work establishments and so on. Now, it is in uh, this context that we must uh, study about uh, three typologies of uh, national health systems uh, that are uh, prevalent in most modern nations of the world. So, I have titled this as comparing national health policies. We need to focus on three different types of models, the beverage model, the Bismarck model and the American model. Now, all countries uh, take uh, some good aspects of uh, each of these models and there are many mixed market models today as well. However, uh, if we have to think in terms of uh, major models that have held sway in terms of uh, policy uh, framework, these are the three models that we can highlight. So, the Beveridge model is named after the British economist William Beveridge, which is one of the main models for organizing national healthcare systems and it is characterized by the provision of healthcare funded and provided by the government. I will look into some of the uh, key features of each of these models uh, subsequently. But let me first introduce these three models to all the learners. The Bismarck model uh, provides a framework for organizing national healthcare systems and it is named after German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck who implemented this system in Germany in the 19th century. And this model is characterized by a multi-payer system with insurance uh, funds often referred to as the sickness funds and it is financed through contributions from employers and employees. And finally, the American model of national health policy, which is also referred to as market based or mixed model. It is characterized by a combination of public and private healthcare funding and provision. And unlike the uh, Bismarck and Beveridge models, the US system does not guarantee universal health coverage and it relies heavily on private health insurance coverage. So, what is the beverage model or what are the uh, key features of the beverage model? First is that there is public funding. Um, the healthcare uh, in the beverage model is primarily financed through taxation, which means that the governments collect taxes from the population and uses the tax revenues to fund for private health uh, to health services. Uh, this is also a model of public provisioning of health care because most hospitals and clinics are owned and operated by the government and health care providers such as doctors and nurses are often government employees. The third key feature of beverage model is universal coverage, uh, which means that all citizens have access to healthcare services and there are no direct charges at the point of use, meaning that patients do not pay for services when they receive them. Uh, it has a centralized administration by virtue of the fact of being a public provisioning model. So, the government typically manages the entire healthcare system, setting policies, budgets and standards for care. And because it is a public provisioning model and it is hugely fund intensive, uh, there is an emphasis on preventive and primary care uh, services so as to reduce the need for more expensive specialist and hospital care. Uh, we have many examples of the beverage model in the world today. United Kingdom has the National Health Service, which is a classic example of the beverage model. The NHS provides comprehensive health care to all residents funded through taxation. Uh, Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Norway and Denmark also follow this model with publicly funded and provided health care services. Similarly, New Zealand also follows a health care system which is publicly funded. Now, in this uh, lesson, I have uh, highlighted the key features of these models. That is not to say that these models do not have disadvantages. And uh, for an interested learner, I would encourage you to uh, watch the documentary by Tom Reed titled uh, Sickness Around the World to have a, a very extensive overview about of on some of the important healthcare models across the first world. Um, so, you will find this, this documentary is available uh, freely for uh, learners and you can watch this online, which is an eye-opening documentary on healthcare models. 
The Bismarck model has the following key features. Uh, first is it is insurance based funding. Healthcare is primarily funded through payroll deductions from both employers and employees and these contributions go into what they call sickness funds and uh, these are essentially the sickness funds are managed by the uh, non-profit insurance companies. So, the insurance companies in uh, the Bismarck model have a very low margin uh, of returns. Uh, it promises universal coverage because this system aims to provide universal health coverage ensuring that everyone has access to healthcare services. And although these sickness funds are not profit, they are heavily regulated by the government to ensure that they provide comprehensive coverage. This is a private provisioning model because healthcare providers including doctors and hospitals are usually private entities and this contrasts with the public provisioning model of the beverage model or public provisioning system of the uh, beverage model. Competition is regulated because there are multiple insurance companies or funds, they compete to offer the best services, but they are tightly regulated by the government to ensure that they must meet standards and provide a basic level of coverage. And uh, while the system is based on private insurance and provisioning, there is a significant government regulation to ensure equity and prevent abuses. And uh, some of the countries that have successfully implemented the Bismarckian model are Germany, France, Japan and Switzerland. Germany, for example, is the originator of the model and it has well established system of sickness funds that provide health coverage to all citizens. Uh, similarly, France is known for its extensive social security system including health insurance funded through payroll taxes. Japan has a unique system of healthcare model where it employs a similar system with multiple insurers and private healthcare providers. Prices are strictly regulated uh, in uh, Japan. Uh, and Switzerland also has mandatory health insurance which where individuals purchase coverage from private insurers uh, and who must offer a standard package of benefits. These are all private insurance model but heavily government regulated. And then finally, we have uh, the American model which is um, majorly a private health insurance model. Uh, the majority of Americans receive health insurance through their employers uh, and private health insurance companies play a very big role in the healthcare system, although there are public programs. Uh, for example, the Medicare program that provides health insurance to older people and to some younger people with disabilities. You have the Medicaid program which offers health coverage to low income individuals. Then there is children's health insurance program, veterans health administration program and so on. But the American model is largely a market based approach where healthcare services are predominantly provided by the private hospitals and practitioners and patients often have the freedom to choose their providers and insurers. It is also an employer based insurance uh, model because a large proportion of the population gets health insurance through employer sponsored plans. Out of pocket expenses in uh, the healthcare system of America is also very high because individuals often have to pay deductibles, co-payments and other out of pocket expenses even if they have insurance. But needless to say that all of these function within a regulatory uh, framework, there are regulations and subsidies. The government regulates the health insurance market to a large extent, especially after the Affordable Care Act of 2010, which introduced measures to expand coverage, reduce costs and improve uh, system efficiency. The Affordable Care Act also provided subsidies to help lower income individuals afford insurance. Now, these are the three uh, typologies of uh, national health systems which are uh, generally discussed in the health literature. However, uh, because we are uh, talking about uh, health policy as an uh, within the economic framework, it is, um, it is important for the learners to uh, be familiar with a theorem called the Arrows Impossibility Theorem, which is often uh, discussed in the context of designing of policies. Now, what I have done in today's lesson is to very uh, briefly and simply introduce this model to the learner so that uh, you can take the relevant uh, portions uh, from the arrows impossibility theorem or the discussion and use it to understand uh, the economic idea behind designing of national health systems. So, Kenneth Arrow uh, is uh, a renowned uh, uh, economist, health economist and uh, um, his uh, uh, theorem basically involves formalizing the conditions that a social welfare function or a voting rule must satisfy and demonstrate 
that no such function can meet all these conditions simultaneously if there are at least three options and two voters. I will simplify this theorem uh, to the learners now. So, let us say that there is a set of individual voters n uh, ranging from 1 to n and there are a set of alternatives or options. Uh, the set A includes alternatives or op options A, B, C and so on. So, uh, we assume that each individual i has a, a preference ordering. In economics, uh, this sign is referred to mean uh, strict uh, preference ordering or uh, weak preference ordering. This basically refers some kind of a uh, preference ordering. So, each individual i has a preference ordering which is a complete transitive ordering over the set A. I will come presently to what transitivity refers to here. So, uh, we have a set of individual preferences and based upon these individual preferences we create a social welfare function. A social welfare function f uh, takes uh, the set of individual preferences orderings and produces a single collective or social preference ordering over the set of alternative A. So, the first condition of Arrow's uh, theorem is there is universality or unrestricted domain. What this axiom basically means is that the social welfare function f should be able to process any possible set of individual preference orderings. In other words, we create a social welfare function based upon individual preference orderings. So, formally f or the social welfare function is defined for all possible combinations of individual preferences. Second is a non-dictatorship uh, axiom of Arrow's theorem. This basically says that there is no single individual i in the set n such that the social preference ordering always reflects that individual's preferences regardless of the preferences of other individuals. So, formally we can say that there is no individual i in the uh, set n such that for all possible set of individual preferences. Uh, uh, strict ordering preferences, we have a social welfare function which is exactly equal to the individual preferences. So, this is called the non-dictatorship rule where no single voter or single group of voters holds sway over the public choices that one has to make. Uh, and uh, in that uh, sense, we are defining an individual i in the set n for all possible set of individual preferences, we have a social welfare function which will exactly translate into the individual preference functions. Third is uh, Pareto optimality here, if every individual prefers alternative x over alternative y, uh, that is the individual i has a preference for x over y, for all individuals i belongs to n, then the social preference also should reflect this individual preference x over y. The fourth condition is that there is independence of irrelevant alternatives. The social preference between any two alternatives x and y should depend only on the individual preferences between x and y and not on the individual preferences involving other alternatives. And finally, there is the transitivity axiom that the social preference ordering must be transitive. So, if x is preferable to y and y to z, then x should also be preferable to z. So, what does the Arrow's theorem uh, tell us? The Arrow's impossibility theorem basically tells us that for any social welfare function f that takes individual preferences and produces a social preference ordering, it is impossible to satisfy all of these axioms 1 to 5 if there are at least 3 alternatives and at least 2 voters. So, if there are at least let us say 3 policies and there are at least uh, 2 groups of voters then it is impossible to find a solution or an optimal solution that qualifies or that satisfies all of these axioms of the Arrow's theorem which is referred to as the Arrow's impossibility theorem. Now, I have taken this example from the textbook on health economics by Bhattacharya, Hyde and Two, where uh, there is a fictional country called Picoria and there are voter preferences here. So, we can think of voters as uh, uh, remember that in the case of Arrow's theorem, we studied that it is impossible to satisfy all the conditions 1 through 5 uh, if there are at least 3 alternatives and at least 2 voters here. So, in this example, we have taken 3 voters and 3 choices. Um, so, for example, the voter type students has choices between federal democrats, social liberals and enviro greens and so on. I have summarized these voter preferences here. 
So the table shows the preferences of three different types of voters, students, workers and retirees for three political parties. And here the assumption is that each of these political parties have a unique health plan. So if uh, these types of voters vote for a particular uh, political party, they are essentially voting for the health policy as well. So in the case of students, the choices are federal democrats over social liberals over Enviro Greens. So it's a transitive preference ordering between these three political parties. In the group of workers, there are Enviro Greens over Federal Democrats over Social Liberals. It's a transitive preference ordering and so on for the retirees. So Arrow's theorem states that it is impossible to create a social welfare function which is a rule for combining all individual preferences into a collective decision that satisfies all of the axioms uh, simultaneously when there are at least three options and at least two voters. So uh, the first axiom being universality which is the social welfare function must work for any possible set of individual preferences. Second is the non-dictatorship axiom, which means that no single voter should always determine the outcome of the social welfare function. Third is Pareto efficiency, which means that if every voter prefers one option over another, the social welfare function should also reflect the same preference. And fourth is independence of irrelevant alternatives, which means that the social preference between any two options should depend only on the individual preferences between these two options. And the transitivity ordering, which means that the collective preference should be consistent. If the group prefers A over B and B over C, then it must also prefer A over C. So, uh, let us apply arrows conditions to the table that we have just discussed. With regard to the axiom on universality, the table shows a complete set of preferences for all water types. Arrow's theorem requires that any social welfare function must be able to handle any such set of preferences. Uh, with regard to non-dictatorship in the table, no single voter type should have the power to determine the group's overall ranking of the parties. Um, third. Uh, if all voter types unanimously preferred one party over another, the group's ranking should reflect that unanimous preference. Fourth, uh, the group's preference between any two parties should not be affected by the presence or ranking of a third party. And fifth, if the group prefers federal democrats over social liberals and social liberals over enviro greens, then the group should also prefer federal democrats over uh, enviro greens. So let us demonstrate impossibility. The preferences have already been given in the table. Uh, we know that the student group prefers federal democrats over social liberals and enviro greens. Uh, workers prefer enviro greens and the retirees have a strict preference for social liberals. So let us combine these preferences into a group decision. Uh, to combine these preferences into a group decision, we will need a social welfare function f. Let us check each of these conditions. The unrestricted domain, the preferences are, are already given, so we will consider them as valid inputs. Non-dictatorship, if we say that the group preference is exactly what the workers want, we violate non-dictatorship because workers would be the dictator. And the same problem arises if any single group's preferences determine the outcome. Pareto efficiency, there is no unanimous preference, so we do not directly violate Pareto efficiency in this example. Independence of irrelevant alternatives, if we were to decide between two parties, say federal democrats and social liberals, removing enviro greens from consideration should not affect this decision. But different combinations of preferences can alter this, so we are violating the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Similarly, transitivity, if the group prefers federal democrats over social liberals and social liberals over enviro greens, we must check if they also prefer federal democrats over enviro greens. But since preferences are varied and cyclic, maintaining transitivity can be a problem if there are three options and at least two voters who are uh, making the choices. So, given the diverse preferences of students, workers and retirees, any social welfare function that combines these preferences will always struggle to satisfy all of Arrow's conditions simultaneously. And this illustrates Arrow's impossibility theorem. That is, it is impossible to construct a perfect voting system that meets all these fairness criteria when there are at least three options and more than one voter. 
So, the relevance of the arrows impossibility theorem in the context of uh, voting choices or designing of health systems is that all of the systems have some or the other trade-offs uh, and therefore, uh, designing an optimal health policy is always a challenge. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, bothers uh, policy makers all around the world, particularly in the context of uh, health policy, even education policy, where there are uh, different kinds of heterogeneities within a nation and uh, the choices that people make with regard to health policy and education policy can be very varied. So, in the first part of this lesson, we have studied about uh, some of the basic considerations that uh, surround a discussion on national health systems. We got introduced to three typologies of uh, uh, national health systems that are uh, that are broadly in use in the health literature. And finally, we got introduced briefly to the arrows impossibility theorem and its relevance to designing of health policies. In the second part of this lesson, I want to draw attention to India's health policy. Now, India's health policy is uh, changing and it has wide scope of discussion. In uh, this lesson, I will focus on the three national health policies that were designed uh, for in India and what are the uh, basic features and the uh, socio-economic implications of these national health policies. So, uh, very early on it was realized that the majority of disease cases in developing countries can be uh, prevented easily under a primary health care system and that gives relevance to the Alma Atta declaration of 1978. India was a signatory to this declaration in 1978 and uh, wherein it committed itself to providing universal access to primary health care with the global goal of health for all by 2020. So, if we think in terms of a timeline as far as India's national health policy is concerned. Um, with regard to commitments, uh, we usually um, begin with uh, the first national health policy uh, that was designed in the 1980s and starting with the Alma Atta declaration of 1978. So, here the primary healthcare approach emerged as a central concept for attaining the goal of health for all by 2000 and this idea reaffirmed the position that health is a fundamental human right and a welfare state should take full responsibility of people being able to exercise this right. So, the Alma Atta declaration really focused on the human rights aspect of health and so in that sense it made the governments ob obliged to uh, provide uh, universal health for all and India's national health policy also was designed in those lines. Now, in India, the health ministry has released three national health policies since independence. The first NHP was released in 1983, second in 2002 and the third in 2017, which is the most recent NHP. And it can be noted that national health policies are not binding to the government, but they are only suggestive in nature. So, India in its first NHP 1983 embraced most of the commitments it made in the, uh, it adhered to in the Almata declaration in the health policy agenda. Now, the NHP of 1983 was India's uh, first attempt to draw up a structured policy specific to India's health sector. Uh, because it followed the Alma Atta declaration along with the primary health care component, almost every other area of concern was included in the policy document. For example, drinking water, sanitation, nutrition, environmental impact and so on. It was recognized that the social determinants of health uh, is crucial to the ultimate quality of health scenario. And the National Health Policy 83 focused on building a more integrated and comprehensive health system comprising a three-tier structure, uh, primary, secondary and tertiary care services. And at that time, it was felt that under a pure market system, health care uh, would be allocated inefficiently. So, in the absence of a well-organized system of public health care, people would be distressed by the cost of private health care. So, the Government of India's statement on National Health Policy 1983 focused on several areas. Um, let us discuss some important ones in this lecture. The policy asked for a planned time bound attention to some of the more important areas that included nutrition, prevention of food adulteration and maintenance of quality of drugs, water supply and sanitation, environmental protection, immunization program, maternal and child health services, social health program, occupational health services and so on. Now, here I must point to the learners that when we talk about a national health policy, uh, we cannot think about a health policy in silo. 
we have to think about um, an, uh, the nutrition policy, the food policy along with the national health policy because uh, there are um, uh, clear intersectoral collaborations between these uh, um, uh, sectors as far as uh, health outcomes are concerned. Now, uh, in terms of policy document, now we need to see whether there are those intersectoral collaborations or not. Uh, emphasizing the importance of population stabilization, NHP 83 referred to a separate national population policy. Similarly, there was a need for restructuring of medical and health education which led to the formulation of national medical and health education policy. Uh, there was a call for a health team approach to health manpower development. Today, we talk about comprehensive health care. Uh, in 1983, national health policy discussion about health team or a team approach to uh, collectively handling healthcare issues is already under discussion. It also recommends phasing out of private practice by medical personnel in government services and advocates the involvement of practitioners of various systems of medicines with the ultimate objective of bringing about a phased integration of the indigenous and modern systems of medicine. Let us also now focus on NHP 1983 and the subsequent five-year plans. India's first committee on health survey and development committee, which was also called the Bhor committee, enunciated the principle that nobody should be denied access to healthcare services for their inability to pay and the state should take the prime responsibility for delivering healthcare. Before the enactment of 83 NHP, health expenditure were guided by the Bhor Committee report and its recommendations. I have not gone into the details of the Bhor Committee report in this lesson. However, the interested learner, those who are interested in research on health policy uh, must visit uh, materials, read materials on the Bhor Committee report. Now, subsequent to 1983, the five-year plans by the Planning Commission devolved finances to various sectors from the centre to the states and it can be said that the five-year plans after the NHP 1983 were influenced by it. All the plans till 2002 mentioned the first NHP as a guiding force behind health expenditures. However, there were many limitations. Uh, for instance, there was a mention of intersectoral cooperation in the sixth five-year plan, but there was no mention of the same in later plans. Seventh five-year plan focused on population stabilization, uh, but the next two uh, FYPs did not mention the same. There was no action taken through FYPs to disincentivize government doctors from private practice as well. Similarly, the recommendation of establishing health information systems was mentioned in the five-year plan almost a decade later than recommended by the policy. So, it took India almost 35 years after independence before announcing its first NHP in 1983 and with the first NHP, a rise in public investment in the health sector also was observed. But this phenomenon of rising public health investment was short-lived because since the 1990s, neoliberal thinking argued consistently in support of privatization and withdrawal of the state from uh, health uh, sector. And this had a strong influence on health system design and financing. Uh, the structural adjustment program forced the central and state governments to restructure their expenditure patterns to reduce budgetary deficits, which saw a squeeze in social sector spending, largely in the healthcare area at the national and state levels. Nearly two decades after NHP 1983 had been adopted, in 2002, there was a public need uh, for a fresh health policy. And it was observed that over the period many elements of the earlier NHP could not significantly result in practicable strategies by the public health functionaries. So, NHP 2002 sought to design a corrective thrust for what was seen as a conceptual inadequacy in the NHP of 1983. The attempt in NHP 20, 2002 was to make conceptual design easily understandable so that programs could automatically follow. Uh, there were uh, a few principal components of the NHP 2002. One was increased allocation of central resources for health, an increase in public health expenditure to 2 percent of GDP and total health expenditure to 6 percent of GDP by the year 2010 was suggested. NHP 2002 also advocated an increase in the share of central government expenditure to 25 percent of public health expenditure from the existing level. 
there was emphasis on equity which means increasing the share of primary health care with the suggested ratio of 55% of resources for primary health care, 35% for secondary health care and 10% for tertiary health care. So, uh, even in NHP 2002, the focus on primary health care uh, was so high which also reflects the state of health of the Indian economy in 2002 where uh, there was a felt need for providing more resources to uh, the primary health care sector. Uh, third is unity of command. There was a need for convergence of all disease control programs under a single field administration, ensuring operational autonomy, implementation of field programs through autonomous organizations at state and district levels, uh, using of only generic drugs and vaccines in primary healthcare services, and acknowledging the emerging private sector. Contribution of private sector in providing services had to be factored into the architecture of the health points. These were some of the important points of the NHP 2002. Now, what followed NHP 2002? Soon after the second NHP uh, was announced, the government of India in 2003 implemented the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. And this act was to force the central and state governments to reduce fiscal and revenue deficits. And this could be achieved either by increasing their revenue resources or by curtailing overall public expenditure. Since the federal nature of the country means that most of the revenue generating capacities lies within the central government, the state governments followed the route of expenditure curtailment with the health sector bearing the brunt of the cutbacks. At that particular time, the all state average health spending fell significantly to around 3.4% of total budget outlays. But in 2005, there was a landmark reform in the health sector when the central government initiated the National Rural Health Mission and the share of state health expenditure in total budget spending increased uh, in line with 2002 NHP vision with a small setback around the time of 2008-9 international financial crisis and this was the largest program focusing on health in the rural India. Initially, it was assigned for 18 weak states but this program slowly widened its scope to reach the whole of the country including urban areas during the 12th five-year plan. Finally, the uh, draft national health policy 2015 uh, set the stage for NHP 2017 and the 2017 NHP had the objective of improving health status through concerted policy action in all sectors and expand preventive, promotive, curative, palliative and rehabilitative services with focus on quality. And in order to make funds available to achieve this objective, the policy reaffirmed that public expenditure on health should be increased to 2.5% of GDP in a time bound manner. So, uh, the some of the uh, indicative quantitative goals and objectives are uh, under three broad components. One is health status and program impact, health systems performance and health system strengthening. And these goals and objectives are aligned to achieve sustainable development in health sector in keeping with the policy thrust. But there are certain inconsistencies in goal setting. The NHP presents about 30 quantitative targets, but there are issues in the alignment of the NHP goals with those under SDGs. The NHP aims to increase life expectancy at birth from 67.5 years to 70 years by 2025. Demographic projections suggest a life expectancy of 70.5 years during 2020-25 and 71.7 years during 2025-30. Um, similarly, target of achieving a national total fertility rate of 2.1 by 2025 is perplexing as the current TFR is 2.2. And India is projected to achieve replacement level fertility in a year or so. Uh, there is no roadmap for reductions in maternal mortality ratio. Several other inconsistencies in goal setting are also identified by many scholars. But if we have to uh, summarize some of the key elements of the 2017 uh, NHP uh, that uh, talks about four major contextual changes that motivated the overall policy approach. Uh, that is first the increasing burden of NCDs or non-communicable diseases, uh, robust growth of healthcare industry, high incidence of catastrophic healthcare spending by households and an enhanced growth enabled fiscal capacity of India. So, NHP 2017 envisions a huge uh, strategic role for the private sector and this is one of the important characteristics of the NHP 2017. So, what is changing? The NHP embraces the internationally recommended 
tool of strategic purchasing to promote uh, cooperation between public and private sectors for healthcare development. Niti Aayog has plans to uh, go ahead with public private partnership models which are already in place in many states across India. Uh, which involves transfer of public resources to the private sector to enhance NCD services and reduce out-of-pocket expenditures. Government is also focusing on government financed health insurance schemes such as the launch of the Ayushman Bharat. And the NHP is also in discussion for its approach towards Ayush and integration of different branches of medicines. Just an overview of the political economy of NHP 2017, the Alma Atta declaration stressed on the delivery of primary healthcare services across countries. In recent years, however, there has been an ever increasing demand for secondary and tertiary healthcare services across all socioeconomic groups. Besides, the coexistence of public and private sector is a key structural aspect of the Indian health system. So, while initially it was presumed that the public sector will serve the poor and disadvantaged, the private sector will cater to the better off, but it was found that well-to-do individuals often succeed in receiving the best from both sectors and the poor often struggle to access either sector for care. So, with historical neglects in public health financing, the private sector now enjoys considerable advantages in healthcare delivery. So, given the state of affairs, the NHP had to deliberate upon optimal policy support to both sectors and policy making in India is largely shaped by macroeconomic concerns and political economic perspectives which resonates the preferences of middle class voters who disapprove of large social sector outlays due to tax financing and so on. So, the NHP therefore needs to include these concerns and approach healthcare from an industry perspective and aim to accommodate sister concerns of health sector investments, efficiency and growth. Now, it is important to understand whether the three NHPs of India have had cohesion in their fundamental structure. Some scholars have made uh, some comparisons. One is uh, shown uh, on the slide here on the basis of a few parameters, whether there is cohesion between the NHPs of 1983, 2002 and 2017. Um, it uh, looks like the uh, each of the national health policy is uh, taking from the previous national health policy and there is some cohesion with respect to how the national health policy of the country is uh, evolving in the uh, present times. So, uh, what we have done as part of today's lesson is to discuss the idea of health policies. Health policy is an expansive area of study, it has very large uh, scope of study and there are many issues that come under the broad area of health policy. Uh, we discussed three different typologies of healthcare models that are generally discussed in health economics literature. We also uh, discussed Arrow's impossibility theorem and its uh, relevance to designing of national health policies in India. And uh, then we briefly uh, touched upon the three national health policies of India and how they have changed the health landscape uh, over the period of last uh, 40 years. Uh, I have extensively used some of these uh, journal articles for today's lesson. Few more textbooks that have been utilized for this lesson are not mentioned here. I will uh, put them on the portal for the learners. With this, uh, see you in the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.